and they were all cheering and shouting and throwing things at us as if it was just a spectator event, almost gladiatorial. They totally misunderstood and miscalculated the anger of the community and when it erupted they were incapable of dealing with it. Keith Blakelock's injuries were just horrific. I was trying to do mouth to mouth and heart massage and uh, I might as well have been doing it on a pillow. It's time to say that this is over. There's nothing that the police can do now. 28 years, three inquiries, 200 arrests and still no reliable conviction. It now looks certain there will be no justice for what happened that night in 1985. Back then, Broadwater Farm in Tottenham was ablaze. Years of tension between the police and the young black community had boiled over. The trigger, the death from a heart attack of Cynthia Jarrett as her home was searched after her son's arrest. The police have always denied shoving her to the floor. Many on the estate thought they were lying. It started with rocks, then bottles, then petrol bombs thrown from tower blocks to the north. Fire engines were called as cars were set ablaze. Then smoke was spotted coming from the first floor supermarket in Tangmere block. Firemen were sent up, protected by Keith Blakelock and three other police officers. It was as somebody had scored a goal at a football match. It had gone for or a penalty. So it had gone from deathly silence to that huge roar that you get in a stadium when somebody's actually scored a goal. We started being um, bombarded by bottles and bricks and debris, all of a sudden just were showering around us. There was a load of people just all running around with crash helmets on, scarves over their faces, all holding various types of weapons, baseball bats and, and the like. <clears throat> and I just realised it's come to us now. This is all kicking off. As the team came out of this stairwell, they were pelted from behind by bottles and missiles. They ran in the dark through what 28 years ago would have just been a strip of grass towards the police vans parked up on the main road. It must have been around this spot that Keith Blakelock slipped. He fell and was quickly surrounded. The attack lasted just seconds before his colleagues could turn back and he could be dragged away. I turned round and he was completely gone from sight. Absolutely, totally covered with people. I managed to get hold of Keith Blakelock's uh, police overalls, started to pull him out from within the crowd. By now another police officer had joined us and was doing the same thing with the other side of his uh, collar. I kept working on Keith doing heart massage and mouth-to-mouth -mouth with him on all the way into the, the nearest hospital, which um, sadly, uh, not long after we arrived, we got told that uh, he'd uh, not survived. The day after the murder, a huge investigation got underway. Within weeks, arrests were made and suspects were charged. But in the rush to convict, serious mistakes were made, mistakes which would damage the reputation of the Metropolitan Police. Convinced there could be a second night of rioting, an army of cleaners was sent in to scrub the streets. Vital forensic evidence was lost. Then police started rounding up dozens, then hundreds of local men and holding them, sometimes without legal representation. I cannot blame the police for one second, for one moment, for wanting to do the honourable thing and to find those who would kill a police officer in such circumstances. I absolutely understand that. And that the police would be hard on those people is absolutely understandable. You cannot criminalise and stereotype a whole entire community for what a few people did. Even at its maximum, the police said that there was 30 people around Blakelock's body, yet somehow they was able to get over 200 odd warrants in the name of murder to come and arrest people. In 1987, all that pressure finally led to a conviction. Winston Silcott was sentenced to life for the murder, but released along with two others when new scientific tests suggested detectives may have fabricated his statement. Then four years ago, Keith Blakelock's widow gave an emotional interview on primetime TV. There was a new drive to the investigation and there were new arrests. One of those held was just 16 at the time of the killing. Nicky Jacobs had already spent six years in prison for a fray linked to the riots. Some two decades later, detectives said they had three witnesses who saw him attack PC Blakelock with a blade. But one of those was a convicted drug dealer, another received thousands of pounds in living expenses for helping the police. 
In court, they were all allowed to use pseudonyms and voice distortion to protect them from possible reprisals. As the case reached the Old Bailey, Nicky Jacobs' supporters were outside every day chanting protest songs. It was the use of anonymous witnesses on the stand that to some in Tottenham was the single most concerning aspect of this trial. I think that the use of anonymity in this case is an absolute disgrace. I can understand victims staying anonymous from their attackers and such, but in this case it's, it's crazy. Crazy because A, two of the three witnesses gave evidence against Nicholas Jacobs in 1985. We know their names, we know where they lived and we know their families. So why are these two characters who gave evidence back then didn't get troubled, why are they being given an anonymity now? It's to create an impression on the jury that there are dangerous people out there who want justice not to be done. With no new forensics linking Jacobs to the murder, the only other real piece of evidence was a rap poem he wrote as a teenager in which he appeared to boast about chopping the officer. It took just six hours for the jury to find him not guilty on all charges. The investigative journalist David Rose has closely followed the murder investigation from the start. There was really, I think, very little prospect that any jury properly instructed could have brought in a guilty verdict given the quality, the very poor quality of the evidence against Nicholas Jacobs. And that evidence, I believe, was fatally contaminated by mistakes that weren't committed in 2014 or 2013 or 1995 or, or in 1991 after that appeal. They were committed in 1985, within hours, or the, the, the chain started within hours of the murder of PC Blakelock. It's a tragedy, but it's one that should have been avoided. And frankly, I think now the time has simply come to draw a line under it and, and say, OK, enough. The family of Keith Blakelock said this evening they were disappointed by the verdict. The Metropolitan Police praised the patience and determination of his widow Elizabeth and said work to bring those responsible for the murder to justice will not stop tonight.